you got your water? Okay. Well, I, I think I'm going to start anyway, just so that Guru has enough time to get through her material, because I know she has a lot she'd like to cover. Um, hopefully more people will struggle through the traffic and show up. Um, Guru's with us for two weeks, and as she just reminded me, she's come back to us after a year. So some of you may have seen her uh, perform for us uh, last year when she did a sort of big picture sculpture overview. And uh, that is something that she's going to revisit for the institution in the near future as she's going to guest curate a show out of our permanent collection on sculpture, um, but sculpture in the bigger world global sense, sculpture from non-Western as well as Western cultures. So we're going to be working on that in the next few days, so you can uh, hopefully have that to look forward to. It'll probably open in February um, in Davidson Gallery next year. Um, but in the meanwhile, uh, you'll remember that Golru Chakmak comes to us from Amherst. She has recently been promoted to associate professor of art history, um, I'm very proud to say. And so many things have happened to Goru, all of them really wonderful accomplishments, including the publication of her first major book. And uh, this is always the crowning moment for, for all aspiring academics when they see their dissertations turned into something that actually has a pretty cover and that you can purchase online. And eventually, this will be available in the United States, uh, apparently starting in June. But uh, Jerome has long been her subject. Um, and something that she started to study when she was at Johns Hopkins University, which is where I met her. At the Walters, she was my research assistant, but at the Walters, you might remember, we have an enormous number of important works by Jerome. Um, he was very prominently collected by that family, so it's a very unusual institution in that regard, and she took full advantage of that fact. Uh, but since then, she really has become the leading specialist of this particular 19th century academic French artist, and she continues to pursue some of these lines of inquiry in terms of some of his students. But her interests have really broadened out into the contemporary realm as well. And uh, it's very interesting to watch someone's theoretical transition from historical material to what we're living with today, which is something I think she's capable of doing very easily. But what she will indulge us with today is her topic, Jerome. Um, we're going to get the quintessential version of this book, uh, which hopefully then you can go and buy. And she does have two sessions to treat her topic, so I think this is going to be a real a real treat. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us, and please help me welcome her to the stage. Thank you, Ike, for this very warm welcome. I'm thrilled to be here again today and thrilled to share uh, this material with you. Um, so yeah, so today is I'm going to talk about uh, the first part of the crisis of history painting in France in the 1850s. And I will try to get into, uh, from the perspective of a very young and ambitious artist, what was this crisis? What was wrong with history painting? Uh, and what were the possible solutions to this? And then in the second part of my talk next Thursday, I'm going to expand on Jerome, the answers that Jerome poses to this question as to how to make history experiential and accessible to modern viewers. So I'm going to expand on this issue in these two lectures. <coughs> The French painter Jean-Léon Jérôme established his fame at the age of 23. At the Paris Salon exhibition of 1847, the most important national artistic venue of the day, his cockfight made a surprising breakthrough into the contemporary art scene. The painting was singled out by the famous poet, author, and art critic Théophile Gautier as one of the most accomplished works in the exhibition, and, the young, and young Jérôme was declared the hope of the future of French painting. The cockfight takes the viewer to ancient Greece. A young boy depicted in heroic nudity and wearing a wreath in imitation of an Olympic victor is excitedly goading on two ferocious roosters in a heated fight. The girl, scantily dressed, is taken aback in alarm. This tongue-in-cheek depiction of the ancient Greek as idle teenagers was nothing like the neoclassical heroes of the great painter of the French Revolution, Jacques-Louis David. While David, in his inspiring Oath of the Horatii, 
had depicted the ancient heroes as virtuous examples worthy of being imitated, Jérôme's cockfight declared that history painting no longer inspired modern viewers to undertake heroic and virtuous action. Instead, the task of history painting in this post-heroic age was to make the ancients relatable to the modern viewers in their everyday, banal humanity. Following this stellar entry into the art scene in 1847, Jérôme exhibited his most ambitious painting to date at the fine arts display that was organized in conjunction with the Paris Universal Exhibition of 1855. His monumental Age of Augustus and the Birth of Jesus Christ was sufficiently grand for such an important occasion. Measuring approximately 20 by 33 foot, featuring numerous larger than life-size figures, this attempt at grand history painting was appreciated by many critics. And yet, having invested two years in order to create this colossal canvas, what Jérôme confronted once the work was put on display in 1855 was a deep lack of interest on the part of the public. The visitors bypassed this monumental painting, refusing to engage with it. The corpses of the tragic lovers Mark Anthony and Cleopatra lying by the foot of the enthroned Augustus left the viewers unaffected, even as the infant Christ in the foreground, delicate yet luminous, fell short of inspiring hope and joy. Jérôme's Age of Augustus and its icy reception by an unresponsive public in 1855 encapsulate many of the ambitions and problems of history painting in France in the middle of the 19th century. In the aftermath of the Universal Exhibition, it had become clear to many critics and artists that the history painting tradition was at an impasse, that at best it was temporarily stuck and at worst no longer relevant. Having reviewed all the paintings in this ambitious venue, one commentator declared, quote, the art of reproducing a historical fact on the canvas no longer exists. Unhappy history painting, pushed to its limits, seems on the verge of disappearing forever, unquote. Another critic wondered, quote, what will art in France be like in the second half of the 19th century? This is the new question, which is not without some importance and which is not easy to answer. Our contemporary art will have to find its formula, unquote. The aftermath of the Universal Exhibition ushered in a phase of profound doubt and uncertainty in artistic circles in France, marked by disagreements about whether high art could be sustained under the existing conventions of history painting, or whether it would have to be transformed into a new and yet currently unknown mode of painting. What the new ambitious painting would look like, what it could represent, and how it might move the modern viewer had yet to be discovered. The next major art exhibition opened in Paris against this background, when historical repre representation seemed all but impossible to critics and artists of various hues. The year was 1857, and the venue, the biannual Salon exhibition. Here was an opportunity for artists to respond to the situation. Jérôme exhibited seven paintings at the Salon of 1857. One painting in particular, a small canvas entitled The Aftermath of a Masked Ball, which has come to be known in English as The Duel After the Masquerade, became a popular blockbuster overnight. The painting shows six figures in costumes clustered in two distinct groups following the conclusion to a sword fight. In the left, a group of three men are gathered around the vanquished duelist. Wounded and moribund, bleeding profusely, the pale face and loose white costume of this figure allowed the viewers to identify him as Pierrot, the central personage of the French pantomime theater. The painting reproduces the costume of the popular Pierrot that would have been well known to its viewers in 1857. This was the modern Pierrot brought to life by the famous pantomime artist Jean Gaspard de Bureau, who, beginning in the 1820s, in his performances at the Théâtre des Funambules on Boulevard du Temple, had transformed Pierrot from a secondary character into an iconic figure. Of course, where Pierrot went, his eternal enemy and companion Harlequin followed. He was immediately recognized as the figure in the right dressed in a red, yellow, and green costume decorated with lozenges. 
The remaining four figures proved to be much more difficult to identify and their presence in the scene much more difficult to explain. Art critics who wrote about this painting in their exhibition reviews referred to the figure in the Native American costume as a Bray Mohican or a homicidal savage. The figure in the intricately embroidered green and red silk dress kneeling in front of Pierrot, pushing his hand on the bleeding chest to staunch the wound, was alternately described as a Chinese, a magician, and a noble Venetian. The desperate figure behind him was called a black domino, named after his black cloth, a common accessory in popular masked balls. The man in black supporting the fallen Pierrot was generally agreed to be dressed in the costume of Crispin, a personage adapted to the Comédie Française from Scaramouche of the Italian comedy by the actor Raymond Poisson in the middle of the 17th century. What was known for sure to its Parisian viewers at the Salon of 1857 was the title of the painting, which provided a crucial hint to the coexistence of these figures. This was a duel which took place in contemporary French society in the aftermath of a masked ball. Their costumes as harlequins, pierrots, and various other historical and popular types would have been familiar to any Parisian viewer who had been to a masked ball at the opera. Many reviewers who saw the duel at the Salon ventured to reconstruct a chain of events that had preceded the scene, attempting to give an account of what might have happened that led to the mortal injury of one of the protagonists. Cluster of footprints imprinted in the snow stimulate the viewer to imagine the arrival of the sixth man in the background in two separate horse-drawn carriages. It's one of the carriages here, the other one here. Here is this diagonal series of footprints that go to the back. The cape and the mask thrown on the snow in the middle signaled the impatience of the participants to begin the duel once they had arrived at the site. Duelists left behind elongated footprints as they thrust and parried, immersed in the fight. The feathers on the ground showed that Pierrot fought bravely against the figure in Native American costume and managed to snip a few plumes of his challenger's headdress. Here are some. And finally, the fallen sword suggests the ultimate remorse of the duel's winner as he tossed his weapon aside in disgust after giving Pierrot the lethal strike. Abandoned in deliberately positioned clues waiting to be deciphered by the viewer, duel seems to have succeeded not only in drawing the attention of the viewers, but also in retaining their interest as it choreographed a prolonged viewing experience, engaging their imagination. No wonder Gautier remarked that one had to wait for one's turn to view the duel at the Salon, as there was a crowded group stationed in front of the painting at all times. While clamoring Salon visitors lined up to see the so-called death of Pierrot, a majority of the critics who reviewed the exhibition begged to differ. After such an ambitious attempt at grand history painting in the age of Augustus, the artist turned to small easel work with the duel after the masquerade. And what is worse, to what seemed to many critics an anecdotal genre subject aimed at gratifying the public's taste for easily consumable melodrama, was interpreted as an omen of artistic degeneration. To this day, the duel has been interpreted as such. Jérôme's turn to lucrative, anecdotal, unambitious genre work. My goal in the remainder of this talk is to show that the duel after the masquerade, in fact, is much more than a simplistic eye candy. This painting negotiates with the available conventions of historical representation and forcefully argues for their limitations in prescribing heroic roles to contemporary Frenchmen. It makes a poignant yet incisive statement on the kinds of heroism available to modern Frenchmen of the day. As we shall see, the costumes and accessories in the painting suggest that these modern Frenchmen cannot come to terms with the changing of the times, trapped as they are in tragic comical repetitions of the past. Among the art critics who saw the duel at the Salon in 1857, there were a handful of supporters who declared it the most successful painting Jérôme had exhibited to date. In the scene of contemporary life, the presence of masquerade costumes, some critics argued, 
made duels simultaneously comical and tragic. Pierrot and Harley Quinn conjured ideas of slapstick comedy. However, blood drops on the snow, the perspiration on the moribund man's face washing the white powder off his forehead and cheeks, the alarmed expressions of those who surrounded him, all added up to a completely opposite effect, ominous and sinister, elevating what could have remained a humble scene of clowns to the level of tragedy. The tragedy derived from the fact that Evidently, having meticulously prepared themselves for an evening of entertainment in their elaborate costumes, these young men found themselves propelled into a situation from which they couldn't disentangle themselves. A quarrel snowballed into a mortal combat, and by the end of the night, one of them had become a murderer and the other a corpse. In many 19th century accounts on dueling, Senseless bloodshed resulting from an obligation to defend one's wounded honor was often emphasized as a tragic event. The core value shared by Pierrot and the Native American was point d'honneur, point of honor, and it had to be upheld by agreeing to fight to death when confronted by a challenger. Point of honor, explained, exclaimed Alfred Dambert in his 1853 book on dueling. It is for its sake that so many brave young men get themselves killed for a seat at the theater, a woman they despise, a somewhat dry refusal, or for an overly animated speech." Unquote. Art critics who looked at Jerome's painting from the perspective of established rules of contact pertaining to the right of the duel found many faults in the behavior of the group that had led them to this tragic end. For one thing, it was clear that while Pierrot and the Native American wanted to rush to an armed confrontation, the four men who attended them neglected their duties as seconds to the duelists. There should have been several intermediary stages between the first insult and the final duel. First of all, after their initial conflict at the masked ball, Pierrot and the Native American should have acted in sang froid and merely exchanged names and addresses. They should have gone home that night, and the next day appointed one or two seconds to represent and facilitate the dialogue with the other party. Next, a meeting should have taken place between the seconds to discuss whether a peaceful solution could be possible. The seconds were supposed to facilitate an actual armed encounter only as a last resort if other modes of reparation failed. Only then would they decide on the weapon of choice and the location, and an appointment for a duel could be made. While a duel was to take place within 40, 48 hours of the affront, Pierrot and the Native Americans seemed to have taken matters at hand and left the city in order to fight right away, each accompanied by two seconds, all six of them still in their masquerade costumes, trespassing many established rules of the ritual of dueling in the process. Those who assess Jerome's painting from the perspective of conventions of dueling noted the ludicrousness of Pierrot's and the Native Americans' decision to have a sword duel in their masquerade costumes. Pierrot's long sleeves and baggy trousers were inappropriate for a sword fight, and yet none of the four seconds had intervened to remedy the problems created by such a costume. Moreover, and this is very important, rather than selecting the pistol associated with contemporary practice, Pierrot and his adversary preferred to combat with the chivalrous sword. Prior to the revolution of 1789 in France, the notion of honor and the ancient right of dueling had belonged only to those of noble birth. In the post-revolutionary national culture, instead of the picturesque costumes that had enabled men of rank to carry swords in their everyday lives in the Ancien Régime, the modern bourgeois in their black frock, black frock coats resorted to pistols, a fact that was lamented by one commentator. Quote, the change that took place in costume is therefore one of the causes that diminished the number of duels, but it has unfortunately contributed to resort to pistol. What a deplorable difference. The sword fight, despite its dangers and its fatal consequences, had something noble and chivalrous about it. Dueling by pistol has nothing generous, nothing of the French about it." End quote. As a general rule, sword is the arm of the brave and the gentleman, suggested Alexandre Dumas. Sword is the most precious relic that history has saved of the great men who have glorified the nation. We say Charlemagne's sword, Bear's sword, 
Napoleon's sword. Nobody ever speaks of their pistol. End of quote. The modern Frenchmen, then, were haunted by the bygone past, by a compulsive drive toward heroic action under the sway of point of honor. In fact, according to the critics of dueling in the 19th century, the overall practice of dueling itself was anachronistic, an archaic vestige of the past. Dueling was considered nothing but a barbaric rust of our ancestors that cast a shadow on the lives of modern Frenchmen. In choosing the sword as their weapon of choice, Pierrot and the Native American made a sad attempt at enacting a historic ideal, reaching back to a romanticized, glorious past. Now, Jérôme could have chosen to depict the scene as a duel between two young men dressed in contemporary black attire, fighting in pistols, and still imbue it with an element of tragedy. Why didn't he? What do the costumes and the use of swords bring to the scene that could not have been conveyed within the realm of the tragic duel theme in modern clothes and pistols? There is something absurd about Jérôme's scene in the costumes, in the quintessentially French and yet anachronistic weapon of choice, in the decision that led all the members of the group to act in the way that they did. There is something ridiculous in these adult men playing swords in made-up pseudo-historical costumes, in their pitiful efforts to reenact heroism and chivalry inherited from the past, values that are anachronistic for the modern times. I want to make the argument that the costumes and the use of swords in the painting as visible markers of historical mores link the figures to earlier historical practices and bygone values. The tragedy enacted in the duel after the masquerade didn't simply derive from the fact that these young people, ready for a light-hearted playfulness at a mask ball, ended up being entangled in death and murder. There was a more precise reason for their tragedy. The young men in Jerome's duel are victims in their attempt to emulate the past, its rituals, its models of heroism. It is the tragedy of the modern times that the Frenchmen of today are under the tyranny of the past, whose precedents they reenact unwittingly, compulsively. But the question is, where would they have learned about the past? How could the past have been so influential over them, so much so that it hijacked their reason? What I want to show in the rest of this talk is that this was a past they would have learned from a prolific field of historical representation that had gained momentum in the first half of the 19th century. As we shall see, what brings home the anachronism of Pierrot and his company in the duel after the masquerade's deliberate, uh, sorry, is the duel after the masquerade's deliberate references to other canonical paintings showing historical scenes. First, I want to discuss a little-known oil study showing the artist's early conception of this painting. The group around the dying Piero in the oil study in the left is approximately the same as in the final painting. Piero's posture, the position of his arms, his head, and the expression of agony on his face have all taken their final shape. In the final painting, the white costume is retained except for a few minor changes. Jérôme would have had a recent opportunity to study a series of photographs of Charles de Bureau posing as Pierrot in the photography section of the 1855 Universal Exhibition. The son of Jean Gaspard, Charles had taken over the mantle of Pierrot after his father's death. These photographs were taken by Adrien Tournachon, the younger brother of the famous caricaturist and photographer Nadar. The series represented De Bureau dressed in Pierrot's signature loose white costume and black satin skull cap. When compared to the earlier oil sketch of Duel After the Masquerade, the final painting's Pierrot reproduces the costume of De Bureau much more precisely. The chemise is longer and baggier, following the pyramidal shape of that of De Bureau's Pierrot. One of the differences between the oil study and the final painting, however, cannot be explained through a desire to imitate De Bureau's costume. The black skull cap in the earlier study has become white in the final painting. Jérôme not only altered the color of Pierrot's headwear, he also changed its form. From a tightly fitting black skull cap, it turned into a firmly wrapped white turban. 
The subtle change begs another explanation beyond a rivalry with or an emulation of Tournachon's theories. What could have motivated such a change? The white cloth covering Pierrot's head is a distinct memory of the turban worn by the radical French revolutionary and journalist Jean-Paul Marat on the fateful day of his assassination in his bathtub on a hot summer's day in July 1793. The drawing that I'm showing you in the center was made by Jacques-Louis David almost immediately after Marat's death. It is permeated by a direct confrontation with death, as Marat looks unseeingly at the viewer beneath heavy eyelids. The phrase inscribed in the corners of the drawing, l'ami du peuple, the friend of the people, had been the title of an anti-royalist journal Marat had published in the early days of the revolution. And this term, l'ami du peuple, was subsequently used to refer to Marat himself, the friend of the people. On the right, you see the oil painting that followed the drawing. In this painting, David found an ingenious means to transform the macabre spectacle of death into a scene of dignified martyrdom. He rotated the head of the dead man almost 90 degrees to the left, thus repositioning the direction of his discomforting gaze outside the picture frame, sparing the viewer from confronting the half-open eyes. In the duel after the masquerade, Pierrot's left arm extends toward the friend attending to him. The fingers are flexed as if trying to reach out for something, to grasp and to hold on to it. However, whatever Pierrot might be reaching for is absent. This seemingly objectless gesture, in fact, corresponds to Marat's left arm and the hand holding the letter brought to him by his assassin, Charlotte Corday. Pierrot's right arm, with his sleeve rolled up, clasps the sword in a tight grip. The shape of this naked and muscular arm, as well as the pose of the hand, once again match the right hand of David's dead Marat, shown outside the bathtub while still holding a pan in its grip. Marat, with his body already taken over by tones of decay, saturated in his own blood, orchestrates a viewing experience that excites the onlooker. In this encounter with the spectacle of dying, the viewer is led to take it all in slowly and to itemize what she sees. The austerity of the space and the evocative color scheme isolate the body and present it as an object of close study. The face with parted lips and sunken cheeks the head sharply fallen sideways and neck muscles give way to death, hands still holding on to the last task they were executing, the crimson slit on the wound on the chest, rest of the body soaking in the blood-drenched bathtub, all function to choreograph the viewer's experience of death. This experience for Jérôme's contemporaries in France was still a powerful one, generating horror and pity, repulsion and compassion. No wonder that for many 19th century French commentators, Marat was David's best work. In it, so did the argument go, David had tried not to imitate classical Greek or Roman art as he had done in many of his other paintings, but was purely inspired by the overwhelming experience he had had when he saw the corpse of Marat on that hot July day. Many of Jérôme's contemporaries agreed that in Marat, David had created a new kind of modern history painting, an original, for it didn't look like any other artwork that had come before it. In looking at Pierrot II, the viewer is encouraged to itemize what one sees. And in 1857, what the critics saw in Pierrot's body was uncannily similar to what many 19th century French writers enumerated upon studying David's Marat. Neck muscles too weak to carry the head, one last agonized gasp of breath exhaled from the half-open mouth. The eyeballs that roll up under the eyelids. The right arm dangling, overwhelmed with the weight of the object and in its grasp. The viewers of Jérôme's Pierrot, observing the present continuous tense of the process of dying, were inadvertently reminded of Marat's decomposing corpse. Now, exchanging Pierrot for Marat may not have been as arbitrary as it first appears. 
This was not just any Pierrot. This was the Pierrot associated with the pantomime artist Jean Gaspard de Bureau. De Bureau's Pierrot, belo beloved by the public, would be equally embraced by the artistic avant-garde, who traced an archetypal everyman in this character. Many prominent French writers wrote pantomime scripts for De Bureau. If De Bureau's Pierrot was the everyman, this was not just a universal, timeless everyman, but an everyman of the modern times. He was known as Pierrot le Peuple, Pierrot the People. Quote, De Bureau made a society in his guise, surely to amuse, with the condition that his comedy had neither language, nor intrigues, nor moving heroes. He created the Pierrot, Pierrot le Peuple. Pierrot happy, sad, sick, good fighter, beaten, musician, poet, naive, always poor like the people. Because De Bureau has the people's sentiments, he knows what they laugh at, what amuses them, what vexes them. He knows thoroughly what people admire, what they love, what they are. End of quote. The iconographical closeness of Jérôme's Pierrot to Tournachon's photographic De Bureau series creates associations with De Bureau's Pierrot Le Peuple. In Duel After the Masquerade, Pierrot Le Peuple is superimposed on a distinct memory of Marat, the revolutionary Lemi du Peuple. But why embed David Marat into the figure of a dying masquerader? By this transposition, the figure of Pierrot the people is offered as a contemporary equivalent to Marat, the revolutionary friend of the people. Pierrot, in emulating Marat, could trace his heritage to a canonical model of modern martyrdom. If Marat represented a modern-day martyr, so did Pierrot. Now, what makes this relationship between these two paintings paradoxical is that Jérôme didn't take as a model for himself David's originality, the presumed possibility of making a unique painting that did not imitate other works of art that had come before it. I think this was exactly the point Duel was trying to make. This is not Jérôme copying David, but Pierrot imitating Marat. Doesn't Pierrot, in replicating the dead scene of David's Marat, involuntarily mimic a past model of heroism? If revolutionary martyrdom, meaning death for one's political principles, self-sacrifice for the greater good of the nation, still retained an aura, Pierrot Le Peuple's mimicry in his final breath, in this final pantomime act of his life, of Jean-Paul Marat highlights Pierrot's belatedness as well as the essential anachronism of his values. If Pierrot is a modern-day tragic hero, that isn't because he is the victim of a banal everyday accident. He is dying because he strove to mimic the past, a past he had learned from paintings. Duell announces that, while the conventional aspiration of history painting had been to inspire its viewers to undertake heroic and virtuous action, the modern period no longer offers any meaningful avenues of heroism beyond anachronistic and often quite fatal repetitions of the past. It therefore declares the bankruptcy of the prescriptive mode of history painting in modern times. But there is, one, there is more to Duel's repetitions and to Jérôme's negotiations with the conventions of history painting in France. With its myriad pseudo-historical costumes thrown on the same stage with Pierrot and Harlequin, its attention to costume and historical detail, as well as by the tension between the comical and the tragic, Jérôme's Duel After the Masquerade also parodies a specific type of history painting that had become popular in the first half of the 19th century. Le genre historique, the historical genre painting. One of the most prolific and innovative practitioners of the historical genre painting was Paul Delaroche, who had popularized this genre in the 1830s and who was none other than Jérôme's own teacher. Commentators considered one painting in particular by Delaroche the epitome of this genre, the assassination of the Duc de Guise. The painting shows an incident taken from the French wars of religion in the 16th century. The murder of the Duc de Guise, who was the leader of the Catholic League, by the man of King Henry III of the Valois dynasty at the Chateau de Blois on December 23, 1588. We are at the scene of a 16th century political murder in the immediate aftermath of the crime. 
on the left, the king pokes his nose in through the threshold of a room in which the duke lies dead on the floor. A multitude of details offers the viewer clues as to what took place, inviting one to reconstruct and imagine how the struggle might have unfolded. Overturned furniture seemingly thrown haphazardly about the room suggests that the victim had put up a valiant yet futile struggle. A creased carpet, a cloak on the floor, and a fallen chair indicate that there had been a fight, and yet the Duke's still unsheathed sword, as well as the freshness and meticulous gro grooming of all the actors in the drama, show that this fight could not have lasted long. Showing up at the crime scene in the aftermath, the viewer's imagination is triggered to play a central role in picturing the incident in the eye of her mind, thereby experiencing what she couldn't have witnessed, the assassination that took place at the Chateau de Blois in 1588. When it was, shown, when it was first shown at the Salon of 1835, Duc de Guise proved to be a popular success. Although its critical reception was far from a unanimous enthusiasm, much like the response to Jerome's duel two decades later. In the eyes of many, rather than a history painting proper, its small format, humorous tone, and anecdotal quality focusing on minute details of period furniture, costumes, and accessories had made it something less than a serious history painting. The cowardly curiosity of Henry III, accompanied by his inquisitive spaniel, the hectic excitement of the assassins as they competed with one another in order to recount what had taken place, gesturing at the room and at the dead body, opening the way so that the king may see better, were comical features that were considered inappropriate in history painting. By the middle of the 19th century, however, the critical assessment of this painting would have undergone a truly radical change. Reviewers no longer considered it exaggerated or anecdotal. Instead, the painting was praised as a historical eyewitness account. According to this view, Delaroche had meticulously researched every detail of the scene to create a historically accurate portrayal. Even the seemingly comic elements were eventually accounted for as skillfully condensed personality descriptions. The king was cowardly, the assassins avaricious, and the dead duke imposing. One key aspect of Delaroche's art that had become clear to his contemporaries by the 1850s was that his paintings were made specifically for the modern French weaver, for a people who had experienced far too much revolutionary violence in the recent past. Quote, Delaroche perfectly comprehended that the 19th century is too skeptical, too disillusioned, too blasé to be moved by fantasy, dreams, allegories, claimed a critic writing in 1857, a year after the painter's death. Back in the early 1820s, the romantic writer Stendhal had already called for a new trage tragedy that could move this disenchanted and blasé modern spectator. Stendhal had specifically suggested subject matter taken from 15th and 16th century French political history, such as the death of the Duc de Guise, the death of Henry III, or Joan of Arc, as appropriate themes fit for a new modern prose tragedy of the kind that could revolutionize the classical Racinian conventions dominating French theater at the time. Investigating a new kind of history painting for this modern viewer, Delaroche had come to understand that not only new subject matter, but also new narrative strategies were in order. A comparison to an actual 16th century painting might help clarify the modernity of Delaroche's composition. A ball at the court of Henry III, which we're seeing on the left, made by an anonymous Flemish artist visiting the French court sometime in the 1580s, shows us King Henry III standing by the door in the very left. Here he is. The king, surrounded by his family and accompanied by his dog, is looking directly at us, while the rest of the room is immersed in the wedding celebrations of one of the king's favorites. Delaroche might very well have consulted this painting in preparation of his own 16th century scene. The repetition of some of the motifs, from the frolicking spaniels to the wooden beams of the ceiling, from the elegantly dressed courtiers, 
to the very motif of the king himself standing by the threshold were clearly observed and recycled by Delaroche. But what a difference there is between these two paintings. The 16th century painting is effectively a group portrait that simultaneously functions as an everyday genre painting. Most importantly, this work invites the viewer to witness and participate in an ongoing event. In Delaroche's painting, on the other hand, participation for us is completely out of question. The actual historical incident of the Duke's assassination is forever lost to us. In showing us the aftermath of the crime scene, Delaroche's painting acknowledges our presence as belated modern viewers. And he has a compositional device for making the bygone past accessible and experiential to us, the latecomers. The clues strewn across the scene aim to trigger the viewer's imagination to recreate the scene. This is the only way we, the moderns, can access bygone history. As we take in the toppled chair, the cloak on the floor, the ripped curtain, the stirred bed sheet and creased carpet, we may very well imagine the dead duke rise up, try to defend himself, stumble, fall on the bed, and receive the final blow. The same process seems to be unrolling in the king's mind, who, timidly standing at the threshold, is listening to an account of the duke's death from the assassins themselves. The only mode of historical representation that is truthful, and the only experience of history available to the modern viewer, is the mental representation of the historical event as imagined by the viewer while standing in front of the painting. By the middle of the 1850s, this historical genre painting had become fairly well established, and its particular rules and conventions had become formulaic. In these paintings, historical actors, usually already familiar to salon visitors from literature, theater, history books, illustrations, and, of course, other paintings, performed well-known incidents in their period costumes. Accessories, fashion, furniture, and architecture they inhabited created imaginary spaces in which these personages enacted their historic roles. Such scenes, when painted with a fine brushwork, clear forms, and precise draftsmanship, elicited congratulations for their science, for having captured historical and local color. Looking at Pierre Charles Comte's meeting of Henri III and the Duc de Guise at the Chateau de Blois, at the 1855 Universal Exhibition, critics admired the painting for having the truthfulness of a chronicle written by an eyewitness. Comte's composition conjures memories of Delaroche's painting through a series of formal correspondences. Just as in Delaroche's painting, here too, the composition is structured around a centralized empty space separating uh, Henry III and his entourage, so this is the king, and his followers from the Duke. Here's the Duke, and these are his followers. Right? In both paintings, the king is presented in the profile, quite different from the standard three-quarter portraits made in, this, in his lifetime, such as this one. In De La Roche's Duc de Guise, Henry III's profile view is highly charged. We're looking at this detail here, this profile view. For it signals his coverness, an aspect of his personality as established in historical texts. Not daring to enter the site of assassination just yet, Henry pokes in his head to get a look and hear the assassins described how they killed the Duke. In giving the familiar face of Henry III from the profile instead of the conventional three-quarter portrait, Delaroche's painting taps into historiographical commonplaces that have been in circulation. Henry III covered Leon Cruel, Duc de Guise dignified and powerful, taking its momentum from a proliferation in the realm of historical representation in the first half of the 19th century, at a moment when the art of painting was inspired by and competed with literature and history writing to create vivid historical experiences for the modern viewers. Comte's painting, the next generation following De La Roche's Duc de Guise, is equally, if not doubly, self-conscious of belonging in a universe of images and stories. In Comte's canvas, here on the very right, 
Some sense of the, that sideways glance in Delaroche's iteration of Henry III migrates to the profile view of the king. One hand holds his prayer book, while the other hand sits deceptively on the hilt of his sword. This is deceptive, for as we know, when it was time to strike down the duke, rather than wielding his own sword to fight, the king would engage assassins. In hiding on Henri's face from us to viewers, this profile view is quite charged in its connection to Delaroche's painting. Here, its function is to color the viewer's experience by suggesting the embattled king's effort to conceal his cowardly plan, whose results we would have seen in Delaroche's assassination of the Duc de Guise. As for the Duke himself, Comte has reproduced the features captured in Delaroche's painting, once again familiar to the informed viewer from earlier historical representations of the Duke. Long face, aquiline nose, receding hairline, and that prominently positioned medal of the Order of Saint Esprit on his chest. Here is the medal. It's the medal in the Delaroche. This same medal in Delaroche's painting has glided downwards in its blue ribbon from the neck of the unfortunate Duke, landing on a pool of blood on the floor. Delaroche's painting haunts Comte's scene, triggering the viewer to picture in the eye of her mind what is going to happen next, the assassination of the Duke. Now, Jérôme's duel after the masquerade may at first seem eons away from the universe of le genre historique, historical genre painting, and its strategies of repetition. However, a closer look suggests that it carefully thinks through these paintings. Just like Comte had done a few years earlier, Jérôme too picks up on the compositional gap separating the assassinated from the assassins that structures de la Roche's Duc de Guise. The cloak, the mask, and the sword lying on snow in the middle of the composition in Jérôme's duel are the two immediate references to Delaroche's painting, which likewise has a cloak thrown on the floor and a sword pointing at it, albeit held by one of the Duke's murderers. In both paintings, the cloak and the sword divide the two parties, that of the killer and that of the corpse. In Jérôme's painting, however, these details are no longer accessories in a 16th century scene with claims to historical accuracy, but accoutrements of a mid 19th century gentleman attending a masked ball. Not only the composition, but also the personages in Jérôme's Duel After the Masquerade also seem to reference their historical counterparts as depicted by the historical genre painters. Isn't Pierrot, in his white costume, a comical reiteration of Delaroche's and Comte's Duc de Guise? His baggy shirt with puffy pompons is a sad approximation of the Duke's satin clad ch class chest decorated with medals. Pierrot is not the only tragic hero in this painting. All the participants in this man's great are inadvertently actors in a modern day tragedy. Enact enacting values they have inherited from the past in their effort to be chivalric and heroic in modern times. One detail of Crispin's costume signals the extent to which his identity has been hijacked by the past. He wears a breastplate under his black cape, whose glittering edge can be discerned behind Pierrot's shoulder. Why should one protect one's chest in an armor hidden underneath a cape when preparing for an evening of entertainment in 1857? I would argue that Pierrot's friend is less in the character of Crispin of Comédie Française and more a generic 16th century gentleman, one who is ready for an attack to his life or to charge on an enemy himself at all times, not unlike one of the courtiers who murdered Duc de Guise to please Henry III in Delaroche's Duc de Guise. Their shiny breastplates glimmering under their short capes and satin sashes, or vice versa, a member of the League following Duc de Guise against the weak king in Comte's canvas, showing the encounter of the two enemies. Jérôme's Crispin has not only made an effort into dressing the part, but his way of thinking, of carrying himself in the world, preparing for a confrontation, suggests that in mimicking the past, his mind and his worldview have been taken over by the past. Isn't this costumed man, in supporting Pierrot, 
impulsively reenacting the past, a past laden with political murders, brothers killing brothers, while trying to hold on to the Duke slash Pierrot to prevent him from falling to the ground, from bleeding to death. Even in the figure in red frantically, at frantically attempting to staunch Pierrot's wound, isn't there something in him harking back to the cardinal in Rand's red standing to the right of Duc de Guise in Comte's painting? The cardinal de Guise, the duke's brother, who himself, history tells us, would be assassinated shortly. As for Pierrot's murderer, isn't there something poignantly chivalric about him? He behaved more honorably than Henry III in challenging his enemy to a duel, rather than acting covertly by engaging assassins. And he dropped his sword at drawing the first blood, instead of savagely stabbing his nemesis to death. Even the well-trodden snow on the ground that notates the duel as it unfolded is an allusion to the muddied snow in the foreground in Comte's painting. The Frenchman of today can only follow in the footprints of the Frenchman of the past. Duel's imitation of other paintings then signals the anachronism of Pierrot and his company. In its borrowings from Davidian history painting, as well as from Delaroche's and Comte's historical genre scenes, Duel's artistic imitation echoes, on a formal level, Pierrot and his entourage's disastrous reenactment of the past. The kind of modern viewing experience offered by Le Genre Historique was an invitation to the viewer to experience in her imagination the atrocious ways in which these ancestors of the modern French had engaged in violence and be consequently moved by this mediated experience of the past. Jérôme's duel after the masquerade announces that Delaroche's project in particular and the romantic moment in which the historical genre painting partakes in general had proven to be all too successful in moving the modern French viewer's imagination, who had been desensitized by the violence to which they had been exposed or inherited in the course of the revolutions of the past six decades, in introducing them to their history, their forefathers, to these ancient pantomimes in which personages acted their roles in history. Jérôme's dualists, if anything, have been moved far too much by representations of the past, have identified too much with its values, have drawn far too many lessons from it. Pierrot, the NATO American, and all the others in Jérôme's painting are the children of those viewers and readers Stendhal was certain were ready for a romantic tragedy, whose cold hearts would surely be touched by the representation of passionate subjects called from the annals of French history. Do after the masquerade then enacts the contemporary viewer's reaction to scene of aristocratic crimes and political murders. These viewers, in their impassioned response, put on the stage of their own everyday lives the contempor contemporary heroism of le peuple. More just, more honest, more chivalric, and ultimately absolutely impossible to sustain, oppressed under the yoke of the past. In this respect, Duel was Jérôme's response to the critics' call for a new modern painting with contemporary relevance, an insistent call that had become ubiquitous in the last decade and intensified since the Universal Exhibition of 1855. Duel after the masquerade declares that the contemporary as such is tainted by a compromised heroism, heavy under the burden of the past, self-conscious of its belatedness, a tragic heroism always already pathetic and defeated in its relation to available models from the past. So the duel aspires to be something beyond a simple genre painting is my claim. Not a new genre, but a declaration of the bankruptcy of inherited paradigms in art as well as in life. Art and life insofar as the dream of high art at its most ambitious is to shape life. This painting was more a reaction than a solution to the predicament of history painting. Reflecting deeply on the conditions for a modern tragedy and modern heroism, it performed a critique of the limitations of existing genres of historical representation. It would take Jérôme yet another two years to explore the implications of the insight that 
there was a gap between the present and the past, and that a new mode of history painting had to acknowledge this unbridgeable distance. Jérôme's solution to a modern history painting was to come in 1859, in the reconceptualization of the canvas as a mechanism that activated the viewer's historical imagination while acknowledging her distance from the past. And I shall discuss all of this in the second part of my lecture series next Thursday. Thank you very much. So I'm open to questions, comments, yes. For those of us not uh, familiar with the history, can you describe the situation where Huguenot and Mercury were defeated and why so many people wanted to be Okay, so Henry III, uh, so this is the battle between the Huguenots and the Catholics, right? So the Protestants and the Catholics in France. And the Henry III was in a position of negotiating constantly between these two political forces in France. While the Duc de Guise was supported by, you know, the clergy and the aristocracy who were staunchly on the side of the Catholics, right? So Henry's critics were afraid that he was giving too many compromises to the Protestants, to Huguenots. Um, so those who critiqued Henry sort of consolidated behind Duc de Guise. And uh, Henry was afraid that they were going to topple him and put Duc, you know, install Duc as the king, the absolute Catholic king. Yes. So where did they get the swords? That's a great question. Yes. Some. Not somewhere to get the, 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 exactly. This is what some of the critics wondered, and you know, one of the critics suggested that they stopped at a famous accessory and prop shop <laughs> to perhaps pick up the swords before heading to you know, heading out to the countryside to fight. <laughs> Arranged ahead of time, whereas here we have them coming seemingly right from the last ball. But without it, we wouldn't have the color and the drama and the contrast. That Absolutely. So I'm glad we kept them there. Absolutely. And if you see the painting, you should see the painting itself. There is a version of this at the Walters Museum in Baltimore, but the prime version is in France. It's a very, very small and a very tightly and finely painted canvas. As you stand in front of the painting, all these details that I show you uh, open up. It's like looking at a jewel box. It really draws you in. There's something very hypnotic about the fine brush you know, that, that literally inscribed all of these details on the canvas. So it's quite a pleasure to look at. When was the Not throughout the 19th century. They tried to, they said that, no, we can't outlaw it. Even if we outlaw it, people will continue fighting. So at least let's try to develop a standardized set of rules of conduct. So that was what the effort was aimed at. But it didn't happen until the 20th century. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's always a conflict between individual men. I mean, they're always like, beat up on each other. Right, absolutely. This is, this is more of a ritual that they could not eradicate until the early 20th century. Yes? Can you comment on the fact that, at least I couldn't see it, that there's no visible blood? On there is a little. There is a little. Let me, very little. <laughs> he was stabbed to death. He was stabbed to death. Yeah, let's, let me find a good detail here. So I'm going to show you two details. So one of them is here. It's fairly red, and especially under his hand. And then when you're standing in front of the painting, you notice this. And then the painting sort of makes you look further down. And now when you look down, what you see is there is a pool of red blood, just like in David's Mara on the snow as well. But again, it's very minute. It invites you to look at it very closely and then to follow sort of its, its 
prescriptions to you. Look this way, look that way, now look there. Like it's, it's a very authoritarian painting. Jerome's paintings are like that. When you stand in front of them, it tells you exactly what to look at in what sequence. But then it leaves the experience to you, to your imagination, which he's going to take to completely new levels, as I will discuss in his later paintings next week. Then the complexity of what you unpack about what Jerome was doing in this painting. Did you were there um, original sources of writings by Jerome about his process that you have now imagined for us or described to us? How did you connect with his own process in all the details? Jerome, as I got to discover in the past decade or so was extremely quiet when it came to uh, writing what he thought he was doing, to the extent of not even correcting the critics of his paintings. As we will discuss next week, there were some very gross misunderstandings about specific details in specific paintings that his contemporaries wrote about. And when you look at the painting, you see that it's something completely different than what the critic is saying. Jerome didn't even bother correct them. So he was, he was really very, very quiet. So my process was uh, reading, first of all, reading the reviewers who saw this painting in 1857, like tens if not hundreds of reviews, to sort of establish the horizon of expectations or the horizon of meanings that this painting could have inhabited at that time. That was very important in my process. But then, not only Jerome's paintings, but also other paintings in the salon, right? And then it slowly started, sort of that exploration slowly expanded. Then I started reading about sort of Duel and what people were writing about it. So, you know, my understanding of the possible meanings is really based on what people are writing at that time. Of course, what people are writing at that time is their very subjective perception of what was going on. So as historians, that is not the only thing that we can base our arguments on. The other thing I did very carefully is look at the paintings themselves very carefully, because believe it or not, uh, art historians receive you know, certain explanations about what certain paintings mean or how they fit in the history of art, and they don't really bother standing in front of the paintings and looking at them. Once you look at those paintings, you actually start seeing things that doesn't fit the broader art historical narrative. And Jerome's paintings in particular are very rich. Like These paintings are very intelligent and they do very many things that contemporary art historical practice doesn't explain, right? He's put into this niche of the boring academic painter, someone who has absolutely nothing to do with you know, contemporary art in France, has absolutely no ambitions about contemporary art in France, right? So there is still a lot to be done on this artist in general, but lots of other painters who have been sort of pushed aside from the canon of the history of modern painting in France in general. Sorry, this was a very long answer to your question. Yeah, I have a question, going back to what you just mentioned. How would you describe his ambitions? Hmm. What do you describe this as parody? I mean, some artists are very intellectual. They want to be a critic and their own universe to be erased. And, and other artists? are great, bold stylists and want to be popular, want to be loved and adored. And so when, when you have those two poles, where do you see them? Great question. Uh, I cannot really generalize. Jerome was like this to his entire life. He died in 1904, and he was a very prolific artist. You know, At different moments, the ambitions differ. But looking at this particular moment that I wrote about in my book, this particular moment, on the one hand, obviously he's very ambitious. Very ambitious, right? The age of Augustus I showed you is a monumental painting that you know, people would maybe undertake in their mature years, right? So he certainly wants to be you know, one of the leading figures in French art. Uh, but on the other hand, at that moment in 1855, when he shows that big painting and when pe people are bored and they walk away to look at other things, he doesn't have an answer to the question. Like, what direction should painting go? 
And later on, he's experimenting. He never has a clear answer for a while, right? What direction art should go? He has a very clear answer about what art should do, but he doesn't have a clear answer about how it should accomplish this. So, you know, the, the story of his later career is still to be written, I believe. But he's very, very ambitious. But he also truly, genuinely believes in the mission of art. So, you know, I certainly don't have a cynical approach to his desire to make paintings that are understood, that are relatable, right? Uh, this is uh, a Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Temperature. Right. Yes. The right. Of a specific type of climate that calls on the sense of skin, of touch, of nice. the, the feel of being. That is, as you will argue later, it is quasi human. Mm. So, you know, one thing that strikes me in particular about your presentation about the modernity of what he's trying to do is the mediation of violence. So, the filmic aspect hmm. of how he approaches painting, history painting, or a redefined history painting, is so incredibly modern in this regard. And one reason people respond to Jerome's paintings the way they do now is because they're so familiar with it in its filmic guise that they don't recognize that he anticipated hmm. the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in other words, the, the screen, and you know, I've been thinking about this in terms of the existing pandemic instead, but the screen. into a fictional world that's completely continuous, only through your eyes, or through your eyes, through all your senses. And that he can do that in paint is remarkable. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I mean, the thing that uh, I think people miss so frequently, and it's really because of the construction of modernism as we understand it, you know, it's because of people like the Aqua who wrote copiously and defined themselves in terms of tradition as that artist, the equivalent of an art, the actual uh, humility of Jerome, because he never really spoke about himself like this, is kind of the thing that did him a disservice. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like his unwillingness to theatricalize his own relationship to the art of the past mm -hmm. is what caused him to be neglected. Whereas, if, you know, the pockets just never stopped talking. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He just never stopped talking and writing um, and thinking about himself. I don't think that means he's not incredibly ambitious. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, artists who worked with him and who knew him realized just how what he represented. But you know, if he knew what we now consume digitally from theaters, he was that's 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 what it was. That's what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. I don't agree. <laughs> I absolutely disagree, actually, with that. Um, last year, I gave a, when I gave my history painting talk here, uh, I think I showed a clip from Ridley Scott's Gladiator. I don't know whether any of you were here, right? And I compared it to a you know, Gladiator fight scene from Jerome. And one thing, when you compare a painting like Jerome's, which means, stand in front of the painting, it doesn't show you the event as it's happening, right? But it gives you enough clues that you have to actively work to bring together these clues. And then in your imagination, you visualize what happened, right? So something he learns from Delaroche. It is so different than what, you know, blockbuster movies do for us today. Blockbuster movies say, okay, sit. I'm going to show you everything as if you are there. You know, talk about authoritarianism, like contemporary Hollywood cinema is much more authoritarian in the sense that this is exactly how you experience this thing. I transport you to the bar. Jerome is absolutely against it. What Jerome does, like, okay. Yeah. It works experientially. Right. Because obviously the medium is static. As you say, your imagination can be engaged in the period of time. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Absolutely. What I'm trying to say is that in as much as the modern novel is an anticipation of an art form that is fully absorbed in the way that we now experience them, which is, as you say, authoritarian, I do think it is anticipating that it's absolutely like yes. what it's wanting. Right. It is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not saying that Jerome would, he couldn't have understood what that would feel like, but I'm saying that his ambition is such that he can make That's very true. Like yes. you are really there. There, yeah. And it, you know, it is through his mechanism, it's through his ability to include us, as you said. But the way that he paints is so, uh, hmm. it, it's so anticipatory. Uh, and, and very different from the airlessness of the Ash. Right. You know, if, you, if you look at these other earlier scenes uh, that are attempting to be as, as, as accurate historically as possible, mm. they don't have any sense of the humanity. They don't have any sense of atmosphere. I mean, it's like they're, uh, they're theatrically lit on a stage, right. but the light is obviously not real. Right. Whereas with Jerome, in that particular painting, you Definitely see that there's an attempt to engage all of your senses in a way that feels like you are physically, somatically. Absolutely. Yes. Um, that, you know, that's, I, I totally agree with what yeah. you're saying in terms of the difference between Quentin Smith and Scott. He's, he's learning from when Jerome is. He is, yes. Trying it cinematically. Yeah. But I, I'm just saying that there's a connection in a really strange way between, and I, I do totally agree with you that it has to do with the mediated violence. Um, and, and that is the direct. Into the kind of mediation, over mediation, over mediation, right? Exactly. Right absolutely. Yeah. But, but you know, I mean, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. right. I mean, the way that, that you experience film is actually a completely different thing. I'm just saying that he, in a way, really kind of anticipates. Right. That. Right. And, and that is really what fiction is, and that is another way that you can define what Jean accomplished. It's pictorial fiction. And pictorial fiction didn't really exist as an ideal before modernity. Right. And which is why the novel, the modern novel, didn't really exist in the way that it does so abundantly in the 19th century, especially the second half of the 19th century. So in other words, when you talk about the accumulation of clues, right, that is something that is a learned habit of consuming fiction that belongs to a literary Model, absolutely. Right? Because you don't tell stories that way until you get to the point no, absolutely. where it becomes a clue yep. for very similar to you, right? So if you're a writer, the thing that you do is include so many details that it seems like it has to be real because yep. there's so many things to know. If I just said the dog walked into the room, that doesn't have the same effect as the dog panting up to two miles of running where the stomach is still bloated from this morning. You know, all those little things are what pull you into the fiction. And in the same way, you look at the generalization of detail of Michelangelo's work versus the kind of detail that you'll find in the paintings of your own or the Rush. It's extraordinary. Every little strip that is articulated. So that you can imagine feeling that piece of fabric. You know, so it's a very different model of making you unaware that you're falling into fabrication. And, and you know, that would be the thing that struck me again as an allegory. This painting's meditation on doubt and the doubting Thomas, right. which is yep. definitely a part of the discourse. Yep. Yep. It almost calls attention farcically to exactly the fact that you're mistaken. You're painting for something that actually is happening. And the whole that is telling you that it's in the telling you exactly that mistake. And how hard is the uh, We live in an age now where you can't differentiate. Between what is fake news and real news, what is true and false, and, and the inability to find hard and fast rules for making that distinction is again a part of our connection to the 19th century when we're really starting to confront all of these things in the patient. Mm -hmm. But the Doubting Thomas is a yep. oh, yeah. of a Christian tradition. Right. The Doubting Thomas is a church yep. of the 20s year old, the woman trying to figure out the Christian mm -hmm. life. And that's the cover of my book, basically, that detail. <laughs> yeah. uh, were these uh, paintings uh, done on commission? Or on no. Spec? And if they're done on spec, who was the audience? Who was buying? 
they, who ended up buying was actually the first version that he saw at the salon was eventually bought by bought off by the French aristocracy right away. And then it became so famous that it was bought by collectors in Europe. Uh, and it's in, in Russia, and it eventually arrived in the States. So private collectors, and that's true for very many of Jerome's paintings, actually, that you really have more paintings by Jerome in private collections in the States than in France. I was Right. In our imagination. And we, we can imagine the ball and then the, the obtaining of the swords and then how they came in the carriages and the, the carriage drivers are waiting in the background and are not engaged in what's happening. They're just servants, they're just waiting and the fog comes in and, and then we go forward and then we look at the also at the future. How are they going to get rid of the body? Right. I mean, there's a whole film right, right there. Is it a film right, right. with it? And I never had seen that before, so before I was unpacking it in any detail. So I see that connection yeah. a little bit. But we're not told how to feel about it. It's up to us. Yes. It's so different. It's a long story, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>